In this week's video, we'll review the latest charts and data to help us answer the question, should investors be getting in or out of the stock market pool? We've got a lot of material to cover, so feel free to use the pause button on your video player. Here's what we'll be covering this week. So let's kick it off with a timely topic, sentiment. The bottom portion of your screen where my cursor is, is the Ned Davis Crowd Sentiment Poll. Here's the website. The upper portion shows the S&P 500 for reference purposes. This poll contains data as of November 17th, and you can see sentiment is starting to get a little bit extended. That's concerning, and that's something that we have to keep in mind walking forward. However, we should also keep in mind, in this anecdotal example here, you can see sentiment is extended quite a bit of the time here inside of the orange box and mainly above this dotted line. Here's where we are in the present day, basically the same level we saw in January of 2014. And walking forward from January of 2014, look how often sentiment is extended. And yet, from the end of 2013 until this peak in the stock market here in the spring of 2015, so that's well over a year, sentiment was extended in this box quite a bit of the time. The S&P 500 still gained 15.29%. Similar situation over here. This is our current somewhat concerning level. Here's a similar level here, similar level here. Notice how often the sentiment pole is in the orange box. And from this point here to this peak here, again, a period well over a year, the S&P 500 gained 38.07%. Similar situation down here. Here's where sentiment is in the present day. It's come from low levels to here. In this example, we've come from low levels to here. And from this point here to this point here, the S&P 500 gained an additional 22%. The first example that we covered spans 1.5 years. The second example, 1.8 years. And the third example, a little over one year. Reminding us that even when sentiment is extended, as it is in the present day, we shouldn't be making any assumptions, any predictions, we shouldn't be forecasting, and we should remain open to a wide range of outcomes. Is it legitimate at this point to monitor and be concerned about sentiment and or having sentiment on our radar? The answer is absolutely positively yes. You look at this box right here, it basically tells you that typically when sentiment is above 66 or the dotted line here, that not many good things happen in the stock market relative to other periods, and that's relevant. We'll revisit this topic before the end of the video. But this exercise reminds us that we make decisions based on the weight of the evidence. Sentiment is part, a relatively small part, of the weight of the evidence. It's relevant, but it's not the only relevant data point. If we were shown this Ned Davis research in isolation, we might come away with a bearish mentality or a bearish outlook. Again, getting back to the weight of the evidence approach, this is Ned Davis's Fab Five composite, and it remains bullish. Unlike the sentiment data that we just looked at, the present day reading aligns with very favorable returns from a historical perspective. And this summary table here tells us that from Ned Davis's perspective, a database perspective, the tape is bullish. Sentiment is neutral. They're not labeling it as bearish. Monetary policy bullish and their combo model neutral. Now let's review a news-based sentiment indicator to see what we can learn. It's a November 17th tweet from Macro Charts, where he reviewed the Fed Daily News Sentiment Index. Using this tweet as a basis, we downloaded the same data and reviewed it ourselves. 
Macro Charts tweet had the 200-day moving average for the indicator. Using the same data and the same concepts, we also had the 200-day, but we added the 250-day. The data goes back to 1980. For the most part, this is a very pessimistic news cycle. A very pessimistic news cycle. A very pessimistic news cycle. And when we say news, we're referring to economic news. We've only seen a level like this two previous times, 2012 and 1991. In the present day, we got a bullish moving average crossover on October 27th of 2020. That was similar to the crossover that occurred on January 31st, 2012 and April 5th, 1991. As you can see, going back to 1980, there's no other economic news cycle that takes us down to these levels and then is followed by a reversal and a bullish cross with the exception of April 5th and January 31st, 2012. Therefore, it might be helpful to ask and answer. How did the S&P 500 perform in the two previous cases? The answer is quite well. Both cases were higher six months later, one year later, two years later, three years later, four years later, five years later, six years later, seven years later, and eight years later. Thus, we can make an argument that not all forms of sentiment are extended in the present day. Also, keep in mind, we're looking at a 200-day moving average for the data and a 250-day moving average. If we look at the data in isolation, the improvement started a long time ago. The daily news sentiment index started to turn up in early May of 2020. Basically at the same time this title came out in the May 8th weekly video. When we look at the data in this form, we're basically saying from a longer term perspective, this trend may have flipped. Very, very similar to this point here and this point here. Walking forward from those two dates, good things happen in the stock market for a long period of time. How about drawdowns in the two historical cases? They were fairly muted, less than 3%. But this drawdown has to be calculated from the date of the signal in 2020, which was October 27th. On October 27, 2020, the S&P 500 closed at 33.90. So if we take the historical drawdowns, that says it wouldn't be shocking if the S&P 500 traded back to 33.27 or 3300 based on this historical analysis. What would that look like on a 2020 chart? Here's the S&P 500 during the trading session on November 19th. This level here, is the blue line, and this level here is the red line. Thus, history says, possible we go down near the September low in the S&P 500 again, and possible that we start to get close to the upward sloping 200-day moving average shown in red, helping us keep an open mind about a wide range of outcomes, including a relatively painful give back even if the longer-term bullish trends remain intact. Also noteworthy, this is the drawdown chart for the study that we just covered. We've already covered numerous areas of possible support on the same chart. Here's the 200-day here. This is one of the charts that we've been using in the weekly videos now for several weeks. And you may remember the drawdown charts from last week look very, very similar to this. Based on studies we covered last week, wouldn't be shocking to see the S&P 500 come back down to the same general area. Wouldn't be shocking to see the S&P 500 come back down to the same general area. Not a forecast. Simply helps us keep an open mind about a wide range of outcomes. Also noteworthy, in this case and in this case, if investors remain calm during the drawdowns, in both cases, the S&P 500 was higher six months later, one year later, two years later, three years later, four years later, and five years later for every single case. 
the Daily News Sentiment Index study that we just covered, both cases, the S&P 500 was higher six months later, one year later, two years later, three years later, four years later, five years later, six years later, seven years later, and eight years later. You may be thinking to yourself, a table like this really doesn't help us. Thus, it might be helpful to have a very short episode of CCM Mythbusters. A table like this is useless because the stock market is always higher three to eight years down the road. If you have experience in the stock market, you know that it's not particularly accurate from a historical perspective to say something like the stock market is always higher three to eight years down the road. Here are three very long-term anecdotal examples. If this were true, that for the most part, the stock market was always higher three to eight years down the road, then for the most part, a chart like this would always move from the lower left to the upper right, lower left to the upper right, lower left to the upper right. Is that the case? Absolutely, positively, no. And if our chart were moving from the lower left to the upper right, if we drew horizontal lines, we basically would hit price once. So if this statement were true, and we added horizontal lines to these charts, we really shouldn't be hitting price very often. Well, as you can see here, you can find several one-year, two-year, three-year, four-year, five-year, six-year, seven-year, eight-year periods where the stock market goes absolutely positively nowhere, including from this point here in 1928-ish, all the way out into the 1950s. From here, 1960s, all the way out to the mid-70s. From here, 1997, all the way out to 2009. Making it pretty clear that this is an inaccurate statement and Study results like this do tell us something about the future from a probabilistic perspective relative to a wide range of market outcomes based on actual market history. If this statement were true here, it's very, very difficult to reconcile that this peak here in 1929, we would draw a line like this down to the low in 1942. And this peak here in the 60s, we could draw a line down to the low in 1974. And this peak here in the year 2000, we could draw a downward sloping line point to point to the low in 2009. None of that looks like a line that moves from the lower left cleanly to the upper right. Now let's see what we can learn studying financial conditions in 2020. We've covered the Chicago Fed's National Financial Conditions Index many times in these weekly videos, so you can pause your video player. And clients and regular viewers may remember that higher readings in the National Financial Conditions Index mean we have less favorable credit conditions and that there's lower confidence and trust in the financial system and lower readings mean financial conditions and credit conditions are more favorable aligning with higher confidence and higher trust between parties in the financial system. And we know that readings above the zero line indicate financial conditions that are tighter than average, less favorable, and ones that are below the zero line indicate financial conditions that are looser or more favorable than average conditions. As you can see, Q1 of 2020, we were well below zero and then started to rise. We went above zero, came back down, and eventually cleared negative 0.21 and then cleared negative 0.50. We wondered, using all of the data available to us, how many times has a move from here to here to here or here occurred in the past? For the first part of the analysis, let's look at cases that came all the way down below negative 0.5 after making this round trip. The first time we dropped below negative 0.5 in 2020 was August 14th, and we're in a similar area recently 
The reading on November 6 was negative 0.504. We have data going back to the early 1970s. In terms of making that type of round trip, we have one, two, three, four, five similar cases to what we just saw in 2020. Walking forward from the similar dates in the past, 100% of the cases were higher three years from the date of the signal, four years, five years, six years, seven years, and eight years. Every single case, the market was higher six months later, and one year later, in one case, two years later, the market was roughly 4% lower from the date of the signal. Since our signal occurred on August 14th was the first time that we dropped below negative 0.5, the S&P 500's gained roughly 6.2%. So when we look at this table now, we're basically saying instead of looking out one year, we'd be looking out approximately nine months. And instead of these type of numbers here, we'd be looking at a gain based on history between four and nine percent, or somewhere in the neighborhood of 6.5 percent. These are the figures that we're really concerned about relative to our time frame. If you subtract six percent from these numbers, they still look very attractive. And in terms of getting a larger sample size, we also looked at cases that dropped below 0.21, which is a little bit lower hurdle relative to this hurdle. Remember here, dropping below negative 0.5, there were one, two, three, four, five cases. If we use the standard of negative 0.21, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cases. Similar situation in this data set. All six cases, the stock market was higher two years later, three years later, four years later, five years later, six years later, seven years later, and eight years later. Which is quite a bit better than these periods here. Now let's see what the past actions of some traders may tell us about the future actions of other traders. Looking at a ratio here of retail stocks relative to long-term treasury bonds. Why are we using mutual funds here instead of ETFs? Because the mutual funds have a longer history, hence more data. So you can somewhat think of this as a risk-on, risk-off ratio. Since our model is based on a weight of the evidence approach, we'll be looking at three different indicators. All of them help us with longer term momentum because this is a monthly chart. PPO is very similar to MACD, except it's a little bit better comparing historical periods over longer periods of time. Anecdotally, if we look at all of this data and from a visual and pattern recognition perspective, remember this represents human behavior. This move here, long-term move here with black below red, black drops below the center line. We get a bullish moving average crossover that occurs near the center line and eventually we're back above the center line. This period here really doesn't look anything like these periods here. We don't drop below the center line here. Here we drop well below, here we drop well below. Here we do not drop below. This is the period, the only other period on this chart here that looks similar to the present day. Williams percent R has a very, very similar look from very oversold conditions and then we get back to overbought. This box here also looks similar to what happened in the present day from the lows to now. And the same thing with TSI or the true strength index. What period on this chart looks most similar to this period? Near the zero line, went below, and we get across. The answer is roughly June 30th of 1996. Looks similar in all three cases. Thus, it might be helpful to know what happened in the stock market after that period. The answer is very good things happened for a long period of time. From that date until the peak in the spring of 2000, the S&P 500 gained an additional 128%. However, it didn't start off particularly well. Right out of the gate, 6.5% drawdown on a closing basis from here to this intraday low here. 
almost 10%, helping us keep realistic expectations about 100% normal and to be expected give back some volatility that occur even within the context of the strongest bullish trends. Also noteworthy, between point A and point B, it was not all fun and games. There was a lot of gut-wrenching volatility between point A and point B. Therefore, if you wanted to capture this type of return, you had to be willing to withstand drawdowns along the way. And this chart goes from 1996 into the spring of 2000, and for the most part, it does go from the lower left to the upper right which is quite a bit different from these periods here. How about the message from the technology sector? Once again, we're trying to learn what the past actions of some traders may tell us about the future action of other traders. This is the NASDAQ composite index divided by the price of a 30-year treasury bond. In this case, we have a period of consolidation that lasts over a year. We get a bullish cross here on PPO early in 2013, late in 2012. And after that, a very, very sharp and nice rally in the ratio. Similar situation here after a long-term period of consolidation in the ratio. We get a bullish cross here simultaneously we get a break from the box after that good things happen for a long period of time all good things must come to an end and or the market needs to consolidate its gains and once again the ratio goes sideways has a bullish breakout and roughly simultaneously we get a bullish cross in ppo this period here lasted more than 15 months where black was below red. If that was our standard, 15 months or more, this period does check that box. This period does not. We wanted to know how many times has something similar happened in the past using all of the data that we have back to 1981. The answer is five previous times. Before we look at the S&P 500 returns, keep in mind our signal came on June 30th of this year. Stock market's gone up quite a bit since June 30th. However, it's still very helpful to know that 100% of the cases were higher two years later, three years later, four years later, and five years later. And since we know where the S&P 500 closed on June 30th of 2020, we can use these numbers to do some back-of-the-envelope projections to see, hypothetically, where the S&P 500 would land if it followed a similar path relative to the historical cases. And as you can see, relative to where we're trading in November of this year, three years later, quite a bit higher. Four years later, in every case, quite a bit higher. Five years later, in every case, higher. Thus... The past actions of some traders, which caused this breakout and this bullish moving average crossover, helps us try to keep a longer term focus relative to our returns as long as the present day data allows. If the S&P 500 moved to these levels based on the close on November 18th, which was 3568, that tells us if we followed the historical path, the average case, we would be 25% higher than we were on November 18th. Four years out, average case, 43% higher. Five years out, 52% higher. These figures here and the fact that every case the market moved higher is quite a bit different relative to many of the historical cases or anecdotal cases here. Remember earlier in the video, we talked about the Ned Davis crowd sentiment poll. And we said, despite the fact that sentiment was up here, we shouldn't have a closed mind about the market moving higher. However, this is accurate. And history tells us that at some point when sentiment is extended, you have a pretty significant give back somewhere along the way. 
And that is typically how markets operate in the real world. This portion of the analysis and these three green numbers tell us that it's possible that that give back won't come for some time and it won't come until the market moves quite a bit higher. That's why it's important to keep an open mind about a wide range of outcomes and take it day by day. Remember, we trade the chart in front of us. And this Ned Davis analysis uses the same concept based on the data in hand. And based on the data in hand, we're still in this favorable area here. Is it possible that this moves in this direction and the present day charts deteriorate in a concerning manner? Absolutely, positively, yes. And that may happen very, very soon, but it hasn't happened yet. Anything else that tells us we should be keeping a longer term focus as long as the data allows. And as long as the data allows basically says as long as the chart in front of us doesn't deteriorate in a meaningful way. The answer is yes. You can pause your video player and better yet Google this title here to find this list of 10 reasons why the stock market could move higher between now and year end. From a negative perspective, some of the Fed lifelines are now due to expire on December 31st. This was announced after the market closed on Thursday, November 19th. You can pause your video player here and or Google this title to find this Bloomberg article. We covered this topic in detail before we knew about the virus. U.S. Households Financial Obligations Ratio, which is basically debt service burdens. You can't look at debt in isolation. If somebody tells you that the U.S. debt level, total U.S. debt is at the highest level ever, that really doesn't tell us anything. What matters is the ability to service the debt. We have records going back to 1980. Never seen a situation better than the present day. From the Bloomberg article, eight months into the pandemic, Americans' household finances are in the best shape in decades. Does that mean everyone's doing well? We know the answer to that is no. During the pandemic, some people are really, really struggling. And some people are really, really struggling through no fault of their own. Morgan Stanley says Europe's economic recovery will be three times faster than in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. You can pause your video player. It's difficult to say the studies that we've covered this week contradict what we've been covering since early April of this year in any meaningful way. In fact, results like this align with rather than contradict the studies that we've covered in past videos. To summarize, the long-term outlook remains constructive. And that statement and every statement is based on the data that we have in hand today. All of it is subject to change. History tells us that revisiting some of the gaps that we have in the rearview mirror some of those gaps go all the way back to late October, early November in the S&P 500, or revisiting the 200-day moving average for the S&P 500 is well within historical reason. Clients and regular viewers know we do not trade historical studies. Historical studies help us remain open to a wide range of outcomes. If we don't trade the studies, we will continue to trade the chart in front of us. And the only way that we can do that effectively is if we head into next week and every week with that flexible, unbiased, and open mind. The material in this video has no regard to the specific investment objectives, financial situation, or particular needs of any viewer. This video is presented solely for informational purposes and is not to be construed as a solicitation or an offer to buy or sell any securities or any related financial instruments, nor should any of its content be taken as investment advice. Any opinions expressed in this video are subject to change without notice, and Shivako Capital Management, LLC, or CCM, is not under any obligation to update or keep current the information contained herein.
CCM and its respective officers and associates or clients may have an interest in the securities or derivatives of any entities referred to in this material. CCM accepts no liability whatsoever for any loss or damage of any kind arising out of the use of all or any part of this material. We recommend that you consult with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision.